it's probably not quite as hard to change as to treat a borderline personality disorder. All right. So is your is this subtle perception biofield useful in people with personality disorder? Yeah. I, yeah. Symptoms? Look, the real issue with personality disorders, as opposed to mental illness, is uh, when a personality is very solidly formed and appears to function. Uh, it's very hard to get someone to question it and to step back from it. And so if you could get them to question it, because as far as personality change goes, that has to come from the client entirely. You're just a source of information feedback. They really, there's no exercise you could do with them in the therapy room to change that. They, they have to change that and they have to want to change it. And I find most cases, people don't want to change their predilections because part of personality is your, the totality of your predilections, what you go for, uh, what, what interests you, uh, what has meaning for you. It's said that anybody's personality. Yeah, yeah well, no, that's anyone's personality. But with a personality disorder, you're saying it's disordered, it's causing the problems. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you'd want to change it. For someone who's you know, a personality or maybe they're only slightly disordered or they're not disordered, yeah, you know, why would they want to change it? They won't even be in your therapy room. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean in Gestalt, you know, we, we more expansively describe them as creative adjustments that obviously someone made in response to circumstances usually yeah, growing up they had yeah. to survive and that becomes, yeah. you know, a way of being Yeah, it gets in the world incorporated and, and sometimes it's a, you know, it's a good survival strategy for that time in their lives and turns out not to be so good later on. Mm -hmm. Or some survival strategies people work out are good for a lifetime, but you know, they won't be in your therapy room complaining about them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it stops working for them. Right, so, right. Yeah. So I mean, the Gestalt approach is firstly to appreciate you know, the circumstances mm -hmm. under which they develop that and the survival quality of it, mm -hmm. and then go on to mm -hmm. try to bring some more awareness to mm -hmm. where it mm -hmm. works and where it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but you're talking about something I don't know, deeper or more penetrating or kind of... A well, it's when you, when you see uh, the energetic drive in a given direction, when you see how it's working, there's more than just seeing the drive. You actually see what it's latching on to, you know, what it's hunting, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, what it's trying to make. What happens relationally. Yeah, and what it's trying to create for itself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... You know, uh, you could work with someone to really still try to gain the things they're trying to gain, but do it differently because the way they're doing it doesn't work. So can you give an example of where maybe working with that awareness did make some difference for a person? They were ready to or, you know, your, your contribution or your pointing something out was able to um, be a bit of a tipping point. Yeah, I, I had to hypnotize this woman. Uh, and because she was very overweight, uh, she was very bright, a very uh, alive person. She was, you know, she was actually a, a friend of my first wife, and she, uh, and my first wife adored her, and you just couldn't understand why, you know, she couldn't help herself. And I could see why she couldn't help herself, but I knew I'd never get that across unless I kind of guided her there in a kind of guided imagery, which is a kind of hypnosis. And I did, and I got her, I won't talk about the specifics. I got her there and she really saw herself and uh, what she was doing. Her, let's put it this way, she saw her intentionality and how it had created where she was. And I didn't see her, uh, I'd left town and I didn't see her for two years. And I ran into her on the street and she was 100 pounds lighter. And she'd been that way for a while. And she said she stayed that way. Because mm. she stopped doing what she was doing because she was just creating a fortress. Mm. Uh, when she realized she didn't have to do that. Mm. Uh, but uh, she did it, you know. Uh, I don't know how hard she died it. I didn't discuss that with her, but I, I bet she just started eating better and less. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're talking about intentionality, and it makes me think of an intersubjectivity they call the invariant organizing principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, that's it, it, there is a definite aspect to it that's that. Mm -hmm. it, it it becomes the energy behind the invariant organizing mm -hmm. principle. Mm -hmm. it, it's what drives it. It's what you know actually provides the electricity for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, and but it's it's all of a piece because uh, you won't have one without the other. You always have uh, an organizing principle, mm -hmm. but and you always have the kind of energy that makes it go. Well, that's obviously true of all of us, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Mm. You know, we, we all do that. It's just that uh, the, the real lack in the world is attention. And then it's been taken over by things like social media and devices. And uh, it's creating, from my point of view, the stupidest people who have ever lived. Mm. Uh, because a whole part of intelligence is attention. Mm. Uh, just as curiosity, you know, attention, uh, curiosity drives attention. If you have no attention uh, and you just become a sponge, I'm watching this with Virginia's granddaughter. She's just becoming a sponge for every piece of bullshit that goes down, you know, through her phone into her face. Mm. And it's just, it's pathetic. She's, uh, I think, a really special girl who has, uh, who's intelligent and has a, you know, a real emotional power and capability, but it's getting all subverted by just the fact that she's an absorber, not an attender. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you're talking about so just going back to the, um, the way people fix things or top down processing or the application of theories as compared to you know, bottom-up and raw experience makes me think of Spinelli's worlding and worldview, which I guess is, a, I, I think, quite a, a neat way of articulating that. And, um, you know, we, we need worldview because uh, we, we need to have some certainty and, and structure in the way that we operate in the world. Um, but worlding is this kind of raw flow of experience that's overwhelming and, and kind of rich, but kind of too much for us to, to really handle. So... The, the movement between those two poles, I guess, is, you know, very interesting on, on a practical level because if you, obviously, people get fixed in their worldview, but then worlding, the chaos of that is hard for anybody to, to handle. The, the mm. You know, if you take a drug, then you get go into mm. worlding and it's just too much. But even um, without drugs, it's difficult to do that and overwhelming. So mm. what you're describing requires to some degree being willing to step out of our worldview and step into that stream of that worlding. worlding process, mm. yeah. Did I tell you when you reintroduced me to Ernesto, because of course I knew him many years ago, we'd lost touch. But the, the interesting thing was that he asked to see some of the things I'd been writing. And I sent him the paper on reflexive shadow. <laughs> and he said, you wrote that 25 years ago, I said, yeah, he said, God, if I'd seen it then, it would have saved me a lot of time. Because, <laughs> And then he asked me to write uh, a paper mm. in response to his, did you read the paper? I did, yes. Yeah, okay. And I, I, I thought, uh, he made me aware that I went off into, you know, out of the main park mm. a long time ago. And it's one of the reasons no one reads what I write, because I'm not in one of the mainstreams. Mm, mm. And uh, I've been trying to take a couple of short papers and I shoot them out to people I come across who are you know, giving a lecture on YouTube or whatever. No one responds ever, but mm. I figure maybe one day one person will actually not view it as just a trash. <laughs> well, yeah, because people need to have some sense of identity or being able to fit old ideas and new ideas into old ideas. So if we just come back to that worlding and worldview for a moment, because yeah, you, you know, you've been obviously chewing over that perspective for a long time and Ernesto expressed it in a certain way, using certain language within, in his case, you know, the framework. Yeah, I, I, linked, I linked his language to mine in that right. paper. So, but by the way, that paper is being downloaded continuously. Good. I, I don't, no one has ever contacted me about it, but there are, I think the main reason is Ernesto's names and right. title. Okay, well, okay, <laughs> anyway, people are reading it. So, like, what, you know, what, what are a couple of points you'd like to make right now about this? Obviously, you, you kind of thought about it and responded to it. I mean, what, what, what is your commentary about? Well, I, I actually, uh, you probably won't like this, but my, my view of it is that Ernesto had been wasting his time. 
uh, I, I really like Ernesto. I think he's a really smart guy, and I, I think he's a really compassionate but guy. But in what way? I mean, I, I like the way that he framed those things. Yeah, I, I like the way he framed it, but if he's actually trying to get someone to recognize what that is through that, through that or, or to accept that we are doing that, that we are worlding, uh, uh, I think he hasn't got a hope in hell. And I think it surprised him how much resistance there was to it. That's one of the things he let on to me, that people didn't like it. Okay, I find that hard to understand because it, it seems such a clear description to me. No, it's a clear description. And you don't resist the idea, but a lot of people don't like that idea. Right. You know? Okay, so that's, that's people with their, I don't know, insecurities about their worldview being turned upside down or something. But again, I, I, I would like to hear you make a couple of comments from your perspective about you know, worldview, worlding, it's disruptive for people, it's destabilizing. Well, I've, I've, I've already said a few things about it. Mm. Uh, people don't like uh, ambiguity. They don't like uncertainty. They don't like something which is unknown and that, you know, they haven't assured themselves it's okay or safe. And even in the world of ideas, people with ideas, and then people are very egotistically attached to their ideas. Mm -hmm. This is my theory, you know, that, that Monty Python sketch, it was terrific. I think John Cleese did it, you know. Uh, my theory is that he did it in a high-pitched woman's voice. He was mm -hmm. pretending to be a, a woman paleontologist. My theory is about dinosaurs. They're thin at one end, thick in the middle, and thin at the other end. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I see most theories. I think John got it exactly right. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, you... you you equate theory with worldview. Um, obviously, that's one form. Well, when you summarize, we all have a worldview. We operate under a certain set of beliefs and relationships and ideas. And yeah, and we have a kind of uh, a theory of the real and a theory of mind. Who, who's an actual living being? Is it, you know, uh, my new uh, Boston technology uh, sex robot? Or, or is it uh, an actual woman? Uh, and I, I think that uh, we have that, and that's just part of the obstacle I've been talking about to noticing something else. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, and I think we too easily believe our worldviews and our ideas, our theories. Our theories become reality itself. Whereas, you know, good old Korzybski, uh, the roadmap is not the territory. And we confuse the roadmap with the territory. And those of us who have you know, good minds for abstracting or dealing with abstractions, like yourself, you know, love good ideas. I do too, you know. I, I, but in recent years, I can't be bothered with them because it's just, you know, another uh, roadmap someone's written about the territory, and I'm only interested in the territory. Mm -hmm. And to you know, talk about the territory is, in practical terms, and to deal with the territory in practical terms with other people who are interested in the territory. But it's very hard to write about. You know, uh, there are so many people who have written great, you know, tracks on things, and then they become uh, basically reified. And, and uh, I mean, even the stuff Jung was writing, I'm not really that keen on Jung, but I can see the Jungians turned him into something else. And the Jungians, you know, have uh, created uh, a kind of very rigid worldview. But uh, I think we, one of our practices has to be to constantly uh, be testing our worldview and rethinking it and looking at it again and testing it, just testing it, testing it. You know, reality testing is the real test. Mm. Uh, does it work in the real world? Yeah, well, that's something that you do talk about as testing and, um, you know, as a way of moving, uh, uh, holding one's ideas tentatively or, mm. you know, recognizing that most perceptions are going to have some quality of projection and so testing that out, which is certainly something I talk to students about in terms of, you know, how to, how to work with projection given that most of our perception is projection is that, well, you, you, you know, you're tentative, you hold things as <coughs> possibilities, um, and you check it out, with, mm. you know, is this... You, you, you test, you mm. test, and, uh, and you try not to grasp onto the first thing that works or seems to work. Uh, you, you always, you're always open to testing. You're always open to, 
you know, kind of having another aha moment. You know, uh, ahas should never end. <laughs> there should be infinite ahas in your life. Mm. That should be a blessing. May there be infinite ahas in your life. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, again, practically, maybe you can give a couple examples of testing, you know, times you've done that, whether... It... Well, every example I've given today is really that. Mm. It, it's it's uh, about, uh, you know, re- re-looking, bringing a new attention to it, and then maybe having to reframe what you believed or reframe what you think is the way things work. Uh, really, this is a process that has to be uh, done on a day-to-day basis in your life. And it's a process that has to be, it should be mentored to a certain degree. And underlying it should be two things. One is a willingness to deal with fear and a ruthlessness to be honest with oneself. And that means you have to, when you think you know something, are you just retelling your own story? Are you just reprojecting your own story? And uh, and also, to do that, also, you reality test. The reality test is, you know, uh, if you think you have some perception about someone, first ask them if they, you can ask them. And if they say yes, ask them. And... Uh, not always will you get an honest answer, but most times people will say, yeah, yeah, that, that's true. I mean, and it, then they'll say, how did you know that? And then you have to say, I'm paying attention. <laughs> and if they say, what does that mean? Read Peter's book. <laughs> <laughs> so it all comes back to paying attention. It does. <laughs> it's, I hate to be so simplistic sounding. No, sure. So, I, I mean, you've <clears throat> developed this over many years from your own experience, your own inquiry, developed your capacity. <coughs> Do you recognize um, other people talking about this or training people in this? Is there... I've known people who talk about it. Uh, I, I rarely have read someone talking about it. Uh, people who tend to write are more into the world of ideas, right. and they're talking about ideas. Sometimes, uh, some of it, you know, I, I've come across things here and there, but nothing stands out except William James. Right, yes, you do like William James. Well, because he really tried to talk about these things, mm-hmm. and then he even uh, tried to develop uh, a kind of an epistemology, radical empiricism, and, but he was very open uh, to these things, and he had experiences of his own, mm. and I, I think that he uh, he was a good thinker, but also not the way we tend to find most good thinkers today are just very hard ass and rigid, and can't accept the possibility of anything but other than what they've decided, and then they call themselves skeptics but they're not skeptics because they'd be skeptical about themselves if they were skeptics. Mm -hmm. So William James is, in terms of what I've read, now there may be a thousand books out there and I just haven't come across them. You know how it is in this world. There's just so many things, you just can't do it.